The third of our four protagonists in Fear and Hunger is Enki, the Dark Priest. Typically in fantasy settings, priests are unambiguously morally good characters. Finding themselves squarely in the order good side of moral alignment, the priests of Fear and Hunger are not that to say the least. They're a panotheistic group of freaks who crucify one another. They're also not uniform. Enki and the other dark priests in the dungeon are in direct opposition to each other. Enki is probably the hardest character for new players to get into. He has the worst physical stats, and even if he hits most enemies in the head, he's unlikely to actually kill them. To play as Enki will require the player to have a deeper understanding of the game's magic mechanics, such as the affinity system, and also a knowledge of where to find the most powerful items and spells in the game. But once you've got to grips with it, Enki is a force to be reckoned with, and can be a virtually unstoppable monster that wipes the dangers of fear and hunger away with a wave of his hand. Enki started life already under the form of the Dark Priests. He and his twin sister were raised from birth to join their ranks. Eventually, the two were forced to fight to the death with ceremonial knives. Enki's body, though, is frail and weak, and his sister managed to absolutely body him. It's up to the player whether Enki is able to defeat his sister or not. You can stab her in the back or accept defeat, taking advantage of his sister's mercy. Enki will become a full dark priest in this scenario, and his sister will be raised as his first ghoul. In the Ascension Ceremony, you were to resurrect your deceased sister with necromancy, and use her as a ghoul. You did this, and the cold corpse of your sister brought a smile to your otherwise emotionless face. Okay. If he doesn't kill her, she will spare him, and he'll be thrown into a well, where he'll learn to talk to insects. Emerging from the well, the player may then make a decision on whether Enki burns the temple down in revenge, or lets his grudge go. In any case, Enki will travel the world, studying as much about magic, religion, and philosophy as his giant wrinkled brain can handle. Studying comes easy to Enki, and before he knows it, he's the world's most knowledgeable scholar, respected by his peers and at the peak of human knowledge. But that's the problem. He's peaked, and there doesn't seem to be another mountain on the horizon. Enki, shortly before the events of the game, has never felt so far from the enlightenment that he strives for. In his frustration, he has his followers crucify him, as you do. Enki in this prone position will receive a vision, showing him a man capable of achieving greater power and leading mankind to a golden age, Lagarde, prompting Enki to research who the captain of the Midnight Suns is and eventually track him down to the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger. If you don't play as Enki, you'll encounter him a few times as you journey through the dungeon. Of all the four protagonists, he seems the most capable and knowledgeable. He's just casually standing around reading as giant monsters bang about in the next room. He's also a rude condescending jerk to you. He'll only join your party if you give him am an amulet of the Yellow Mages first. Hmm. What is that? You seem to carry an Eclipse Talisman. Where did you get that? What is an Eclipse Talisman? It's a symbol that you are an apprentice of the wizard Nashra, the bringer of chaos. The talisman holds great powers on its own, but it also gives you a plethora of new friends and enemies. You do not seem to be too familiar with the greater scheme, so I imagine the talisman going to waste in the hands of you. Would you mind giving it to me, perhaps? What is there for me? What would you say if I offered my services to you? I am done with the libraries here, and I'm prepared to venture deeper to the dungeons. Even for me, it might prove to be fatal to keep going on alone. Hmm. Sounds like a deal. Great. You give the Eclipse Talisman to Enki. While in your party, Enki will have a number of insights about the dungeon at Mahab. If you find yourself in the Grand Library, Enki will momentarily leave your party to explore the place. His obsession with books isn't just some neat character quirk, though. Why does one read? To gain knowledge. And Enki seeks the ultimate knowledge. Complete enlightenment. Enki's journey starts at what should have probably been his end. I'm ready, Ulmer. Take me. I'm ready to meet my end. This is as far as I got. 
I can't get any satisfaction. There is no fulfillment. I've reached the limits this feeble body can withstand. There is no silver lining waiting at the end. The purpose of all of us is to sliver under the cold sun the gods have set above us. What's that? These visions. I see. I understand. Let me down from here. Here we meet an Enki who is disheartened. He's managed to become the strongest Dark Priest in the world. Strong enough now to rival the very new gods. But it's not enough. He hasn't achieved enlightenment, and isn't sure if he'll be able to. He's already hit the apex of what it means to be a Dark Priest. And there doesn't seem to be any more mountains to climb. But in the throes of his pain and depression, he has a vision. A man, apparently chosen by the gods, to lead humanity into a new golden age. And this makes Enki angry. After all his hard work and sacrifices, it should be him. He's earned it, and he won't allow some up-jumped peasant knight to take it from him. And thus, Enki travels to the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger, where his vision told him the god would be. Enki travels through the dungeon with relative ease. He's studied the greater mysteries of the world for years. Arguably, nobody is more knowledgeable on such topics as him, and he's able to recognize the taint of the Depth God almost immediately, and the mania of the Sylvan Buddies and the Grogoroth Wolf Masks. He recognizes that this place is a nexus point for the gods, and is prepared for the dangers within. He sets forth in the mines and comes upon this Ramus. Oh, new visitors. My name is Nasramus. I'm an alchemist living down here. Pleased to meet you. You cannot quite tell if the alchemist is a woman or a man. Something about his stature seems almost otherworldly or ancient. Pleased to meet you too. The white-haired alchemist gives you a smile that seems almost too genuine. My apologies, I left the kettle on, and I'm in a bit of a hurry. Let's meet again. Their conversation is amicable and friendly enough. Travelling further, Enki will see the Spectral Knight, and quickly work out that the spirit is anchored to the mortal plane, and if he can destroy the anchor, he can move further on. He finds the suit and destroys it, and enters Nosramus' lab. He'll loot the room, but Nazramus will specifically forbid looting his trunk, which Enki will respect. On an empty scroll in the back room is written the words, O oh Lord, give enlightenment, and the two talk again. Oh, you were the one creeping in the shadows earlier. My name is Nasramus. I'm an alchemist living down here. Pleased to meet you. My apologies, having to resort to brute force like that. My studies here are hundreds of years old, you see, and I cannot let just anyone pass down here. What are you studying? My studies? I study all fields of knowledge, just like all scientists should. My studies have taught me so much about blood magic, deities, gods, and other such obvious subjects. At the moment, I'm the most interested in nature and the heartbeat of the earth. People in, this na people in this age don't notice that nature is being lost, and that they're heading for extinction. That is one reason I stepped down to this darkness. There is still a primal rule of the nature very much alive here. I would appreciate some working peace, if you don't mind. What is it? I'm looking for a person. Right. I think I know who you mean. I don't meddle with anything that happens in the upper floors. But I think the person you are looking for is located in the dungeons, just a few floors down. I'd hurry if I was you. He seems to be an incredible person, but his time is running short. How long have you been down here? Oh, I've been here so long. Feels like an eternity. <laughs> Why are you staying here? Why? What a silly question. This place is actually very crucial to my studies. 
In all of my years, I have not found a place where you could still feel the presence of the gods so vividly as here. As far as the inconvenience of having a laboratory underground, well, people are suckers for convenience. They think the more convenient the better, and end up throwing away what's truly good. Limitations force creativity. How do you stay sane in the darkness? It's supposed to be dark here. We'd be in trouble if these dungeons were as bright as day. <laughs> the conversation is strange and esoteric. Enki finds himself confused by the way Nasramas talks about the darkness and the depth gods taint, but nevertheless moves on, finding the Cube of the Depths and entering the city of Mahab. Enki may find Lagard, but wouldn't be bothered one way or another, whether the man lives or not. Enki didn't really come here to find him, he came here to usurp him. Enki enters Mahab and makes his way to the Grand Library, built by the new god Betal, and former residents of Nashra during his reign, and Voltiel in this cycle. Enki explores its depths and books, but finds no answers, no way to achieve enlightenment. In fact, he only finds frustration. Voltiel's own notes are filled with failure. Enki feels no other choice but to confront the only being in the world who might possess more actual knowledge than himself. Enki defeats Voltiel in past Mahab, but gets no answers. So now Enki travels back to the future, and finds present Voltiel hanging from a rope. It's all pointless. Mankind's got no hope. There is no way to break these chains. That look in your eyes. You are after the Enlightenment too, aren't you? That's right. The ascension was never the path. Don't be fooled by the power. What is the right path then? There was a person amongst us who was right, but we were blinded by the Golden Throne already at that point. One must admit his own mistakes in order to grow. Enki had heard of the mysterious Forgotten One, the enigmatic fifth member of the Fellowship who rejected Godhood, but never expected to meet the person, or that such a being would be so nice. Enki discovers new arcane secrets in Mahab, learning water walking and transmutation. Enki goes back to Nazaramis' lab and finds him gone. Exploring the mines further, Enki walks across a body of water, and finds himself in Nasramis's other secret lab, yes he has too, don't question it, where he talks to Nasramis a final time. I take it you talk to Valtiel. How is he these days? He seems to be regretting his past actions. Oh, is that so? That's a first one. He takes a lot of credit and knowledge, and I've yet to see him admit his own mistakes. Ah, I don't want to be stuck in nostalgia. Sorry about my absent mind. He said you were on the path to enlightenment. Too bad I wasn't there to hear that. Really out of character for him to say that. He believed ascension was the key. That he could somehow achieve enlightenment with a snap of fingers. That was a ridiculous idea. I cannot understand how a scholar like him could believe there was such an easy way. The thing is... There is no end on the path to enlightenment. New information, new forms of science, new people, new worlds. The knowledge of the world keeps on increasing. How could you settle down, thinking you are at the end of it all? If you are on a path of enlightenment, seek all knowledge. Even the knowledge of the new gods. I wholeheartedly recommend that you sit on the golden throne and meet your reflection. But if you are truly a scholar of sciences, only observe, do not surrender yourself to the lust of power. I know it is not an easy task, so that's why you can have this. You get the spirit anchor from Nasramas. That should keep you grounded. Why help me? It's clearly an end of an era, so I'm just giving a little helping hand to the new generation. Take care. Nasramas will advise Anki to sit on the throne of Ascension himself but also gives him the ability to resist the temptation of new godhood, should Enki wish to. Giving him the soul anchor, Enki journeys back to Mahab and gets the other new god souls. Eventually confronting and defeating Francois, he sits on the throne of Ascension.
pitch black new world is unveiled before you. A cold wind carries over unnatural cries from all around you. You are not alone here, even if it would seem otherwise. The void is like nothing we've ever seen. Even Enki is stumped about the place, frightened to tread further. It's a location that even the new gods, with their massive collection of knowledge, know very little about. Enki will wonder it, for how long he's unsure, until he eventually finds something that gives him more questions than answers. He finds... her. Silva, the creator of humanity, and the second most important deity of the old god Pantheon. Enki at this point will be the strongest magic user in the game, bar of course the very old gods themselves, and on top of this he'll have an army of skeletons at his disposal. But even then, Sylvan is a force to be reckoned with. Enki manages to survive her, she slinks back into the green mists from which she came. Given her love for mankind, she was likely incapable of truly killing Enki. Enki's mind, though, will be irrevocably broken by this experience. There's no way to avoid it. She has a special attack that just annihilates the mind. Broken physically and mentally, Enki manages to somehow push on. This all has to be worth it. Eventually coming across himself, or what he could be, if only he were willing, or foolish enough. Enki has discovered the truth of the new gods. Ascension is a lie. A trap set by the old gods to limit mankind. A new god pantheon rises up, prospers, deteriorates, and eventually must be overthrown, starting the cycle again. Enki, using Nosramus' soul anchor, rejects this paradigm. Enki, for our knowledge to grow, you need to kill your ego and move on. Leave your fleshy shell behind and let me continue your ambitions. A new god greets you. Knowledge it suffocates those who are not able to adjust to it. I could not bear the world with everything I'd learned. With the enlightenment and my ascension, it is said that ignorance is bliss, and the knowledge only enhances the pain. The only way for me to continue existing was to change. Knowledge changes one permanently. There is no looking back after a certain point. As time will pass, will you tell people about your monumental achievement and share your gospel? How you passed through all the hardships, the dungeons laid before you, and about your eventual ascension, share the gospel. Stories about your fabled endeavors are passed to people of all ages. Your tales inspire many in time to come to grow from children to the elderly. In the coming era, mankind is at the brink of chaos. Diseases run wild and kingdoms wage war, with hundreds of thousands of casualties on all fronts, both women and children included. You would have the power to interrupt and potentially stop this. You have the strength to stop the mindless killing, but that would require you to step out of the plane of this void. Instead, you could try to affect mankind through religion and beliefs. Affecting the whole culture means slow change. And its effects don't save those in immediate peril. But religion might have more long-lasting effects. Influence people through religion. Slowly, in times of despair, people start to turn to your religion in hopes of salvation. Many are killed, and every new victim feeds the ongoing plague and destruction. This age would be known as the Dark Age in the history books but your light would become an important factor in the survival of civilizations. You are known to men as the merciful god. New deities and false apostles rise as the decades go by, but the foundation you laid during the Dark Age made you the pillar of morals for centuries to come. Even if your power is limited to that of the new gods, your legacy would eventually rival that of the older gods. You set your foot to the ascended plane when you met the reflection of yourself, a form that had taken the shape of a new god. 
The reflection was what you were to become. You felt a great lust for power take you over. It would have been so easy to give in and learn secrets that are only whispered amongst mortals. But you came prepared. You had been warned about the lust. You declined the godhood and managed to step out of the plane that was colored by the green hue that radiated from the underground pits. It's not like your ascension wasn't without its merits even if you withdrew at the last second. You saw the reflection after all and understood its intents. With your newly found knowledge, you took the grand libraries of the ancient city to be your own. The library already contained more information one could digest in multiple lifetimes. But lucky for you, you discovered the secrets of a prolonged life pretty soon. You found out how the older gods had left this world a long time ago. You had taken care of the new gods that resided in the city of the gods. You did not need Godhood to chase after the true enlightenment. You did not need Godhood to become the most powerful mortal to exist. The Enki we meet at the beginning of the game is a young man to whom magic has always come easy. He's a borderline genius, the foremost scholar of his age. He just can't achieve enlightenment. So what is enlightenment? Well, it's a little complicated. I suppose if you want it simplified, it essentially means to gain a greater understanding. Real world religions like Buddhism aspire to enlightenment. Even atheism is a kind of enlightenment from the point of view of an atheist. In the context of fear and hunger though, it seems to be reaching the same level of understanding as the old gods. Nosramus and Voltiel stand as evidence that such a thing is impossible. Voltiel thought that by learning the secret of life, he would be able to close the gap between the old gods and the new. There's just one problem. He's a bit of a pervert, and he's completely abandoned all pretenses of morality, and is experimenting haphazardly, having sex with his own creations and creating abominations. Voltiel, despite his intellect and ambition, is completely ruled by his base human needs, specifically lust. Nos Ramis, meanwhile, appears somewhat otherworldly than all the other new gods. She lurks in the dungeon's minds, its oldest ghost. What exactly she's trying to accomplish at this point is a bit esoteric, but considering how she clearly doesn't wish for Enki to ascend, and subtly guides the party to Mahab in the event of Lagarde's death, it's likely that she's trying to break humanity out of its trap. Though strangely, Nos Ramis also seems to think that the god might be a key to this, Upon the death of the captain, Nosramus becomes something of a mentor for Enki, teaching him the most important lesson he's learned in his entire life. Enlightenment is a house, built stone by stone. It won't be achievable without tremendous effort, if it can be reached at all. One thing missing from Enki's S run, though, is the headless wizard. In hard mode, the player can't have companions, so it's impossible to recruit the crawling chaos known as Nashra. Though make no mistake, Nashra is involved in Enki's story. The Enki we encounter in the dungeon is interested in finding the bodiless wizard, and though he doesn't appear in Enki's S quest, his is a perspective Enki would no doubt want to pursue. There is a question over whether Enki really did battle with Sylvan. Enki is powerful, the most powerful human in the world one could argue by the time his journey through Mahab is over, but Sylvan is the concept of love and creation given form. One can't fight her any more than one can fight the sun. Yet in his S run, Enki succeeds. It's very niche, with Enki literally killing his god, or at least swatting them away. Go on, shoo, shoo, to achieve his own form of ascension. And the bigger question here remains, what exactly is Enki's canon journey through the dungeon? In Fear and Hunger Tamina, we have irrefutable proof that Enki was able to survive the events of Fear and Hunger in the Skin Bibles. The Skin Bibles are books written by Enki, detailing the lost lore of the old gods. Even old gods that have seemingly been lost to time. Grogoroth, Sylvan, Rare, Ulmer, Fear and Hunger, Venushka. Enki has catalogued them all, and given mankind a boon of knowledge. Interestingly, in one of his books, Enki claims that he saw the death of the God of the Depths, the sleeping god that poisons the very earth above it, and there's no reason to believe Enki is lying here. If anything, he's honest to a fault, to the point of creating enemies out of potential allies if he isn't too careful, if he finds them too irritable. But it does raise the question of how. 
The god of the depths does indeed die during the events of fear and hunger, those strange, colossal, beating pieces of flesh that are the hearts of the old god. And if you destroy all three, the god will die. Is that what he meant? That he stabbed all the hearts? Or that he looked at the body as it died? Or does he mean something even more metaphysical? It's actually possible that Enki is still alive during the events of Tamina. After all, Nosramus was able to live for over 700 years without becoming a new god. There's no reason to believe that Enki couldn't have mastered that very same power. But who's to say for sure? One interesting point is Enki's continued alienation from the other Dark Priests. While his work has spread far and wide, and his ruminations on the greater mysteries have been absorbed into the teaching and cultures of the priesthood and the Vatican Church, he is not without his opposition. In Prehiville, we can find this note in the Catacombs of the Church. I have read contrary beliefs, ridiculous beliefs even, from facets not to be named here, from an epithet facet well known in occult circles, despite his biased view on the world of the otherworldly. Just because this not to be named dark priest wrote a book that is cited in most occult studies, doesn't mean his word shouldn't be taken with a pinch, no, with a jar of salt. Words about the death of an older god especially are nothing short of absurd. How do you kill an idea, an inspiration, or one of the primordial concepts once it is conceived? The thought will forever haunt your mind as long as our consciousness is there to remind us of it. Once an older god is born, it has existed forever. A god, like a human soul, is not constrained by linear time and space. It can reincarnate multiple times within our history, and future history, without us knowing any better. They spawn from the green stream. But which spawns first? An older god in its physical form, or the concept our consciousness gave birth to? The mockery that is the new gods, the puppets yearning to become the puppeteers should never be mistaken with the gods that dwell beyond our understanding. They are just byproducts of the immense influence the older gods hold on us. Just by flying too close to the sun, or why not the moon? And one can attain a glimpse of the true intensity that is older gods. Men inherited the power from the beasts that walked before us. How could such power come even close to that of the older gods? The priests of Prehivil are insane, and worship beings that even Nashra knows little about. So who's to say how much of the wider priesthood they represent? If they represent any of it besides themselves at all. Enki, though, is one of the most intriguing characters in the series. Enki's journey, despite being filled with gods and monsters, is ultimately a human one. He accepts that he's limited by his humanity, that his enlightenment can't be something given, but something that must be painstakingly earned. It's a process of sacrifice and perseverance. And in the end, he arguably did more for humanity than the god, despite his own self-centered intentions. One has to wonder, if Enki alone could see through the trap of the old god, and Nasramus was there to warn about the trap of the old gods, then why did the Fellowship become new gods? What was their motivation? What were they thinking? Well, we'll find out next time.